quantum charge transfer successful semiconductor thank you anupam yeah, so i am going to talk about quantum charge pumping flow case states and uh, pumping in uh, topological insulators and this is a work i did with uh, professor deepthi mansain uh, professor saurin das who is at delhi university deepthi man is at uh, indian institute of science bangalore here and sumati rao who is in harish chandra research institute allahabad and this is a work uh, so most part of this work was done during my phd and i finished my phd in 2013 and now i am a postdoc at icts bangalore and these are the two papers which came out of uh, yeah that work and uh, so there are lot more details uh, in these papers i am going i am going to talk only about a part of what is there in these papers so you are most welcome to take a look at these papers and this is going to be the outline of my talk first i'll introduce what is charge pumping and uh, it can be either quantum or classical so i'll explain that uh, then i'll talk about my work on quantum charge pumping in a finite ring and then i'll talk about this adiabatic pumping formula that is when you have a scatterer and there is a pumping because of that scatterer and then i'll actually give a brief introduction of topological insulators uh, to be more precise two dimensional topological insulators which is called quantum spin hole insulators and then i'll talk about uh, pumping on this two dimensional topological insulators <clears throat> so what is charge pumping so basically <laughs> for any transport to happen Uh, from one reservoir to the other you generally need a difference in the chemical potential uh, but charge transfer can also happen between two reservoirs which are maintained at same chemical potential and temperature uh, by the application of time dependent forces in the transport channel so that is charge pumping so a simple example is you have a river let us say and you are standing in the middle you take a bucket and throw water from one side to the other so that is pumping basically in the simplest words and a necessary condition for this to happen is the left right asymmetry that is left right symmetry in the system should be broken and this is a dc response to an ac driving signal and the pumping can be classical or quantum and one example is this so from a lower um, chemical potential you can uh, pump the charge to a higher chemical potential so this is a simple example of this so the work is basically done in the channel for this transport okay so this is a screw pump it's also called archimedean pump uh yeah so what is quantum in this so it is so quantum charge pumping is when the electron flow is driven by the cyclic changes in the electron wave function and quantum pumping is characterized by the quantum interference effects so that's the difference between the classical pump and the quantum pump and so in our work we have studied two kind of systems a one dimensional channel which is connected to two reservoirs and i'll tell you the main result here so the main result here is that if you have pumping potential only at a single spatial point in the channel and if you break a left right break the left right symmetry by some sort of static potential then you can pump charge from one reservoir to the other so that's the result that we have on this on a 1d channel which is connected to two reservoirs and the other system that we considered was a finite ring disc, uh, described by tight binding model so i'll go into details uh, of this yes so this is a hamiltonian so this is written in the second quantized language so this is basically the hopping from n plus 1th site to nth site and there are a finite number of sites and there is a periodic boundary condition the capital n plus 1 is identified with uh, 1 so this is a hopping and this is the on site potentials and this is a time dependent potential so the on site potentials can be time dependent and there is a period t so this uh, this is a periodic function wn of t this is a this has a period t and there are different phases phi n on the different sites and uh, okay there is a bn which is the amplitude also so what we have done is using a non perturbative method we calculate the long time averaged current in such systems so in a quantum system generally okay you start with an initial state and let it evolve according to the unitary hamiltonian evolution you have the schrodinger wave equation and that's what you do and here this is a purely unitary hamiltonian evolution so we don't really expect so we don't expect the system to reach a steady state 
then how do you answer this question whether there is a pump whether there is a charge which is pumped in the clockwise direction or anti clockwise direction then the answer to that is we find the long time average current which can be calculated with an exact formula it's non perturbative and using this formula we can tell whether the charge is pumped in the clockwise direction or anti clockwise direction or in other words in the long time uh, whether there is a steady state current in the clockwise direction or anti clockwise direction so that is the question so what we do how do we calculate so we divide so let's say we divide the time interval from ti to tf into m equal slices with this width dt and then this is that unitary time evolution operator see here the hamiltonian is time dependent so uh, it has different e to the i h of t at different times so one has to do this kind of multiplication to get the unitary time evolution operator then you have to take the limit of m going to infinity to make this smooth and then so now you have this unitary time evolution operator which takes you from initial time ti to final time tf so now let us look at the time evolution operator from time t equal to 0 to capital t so capital t is the time period of the periodic driving potential that we have and let vj and e to the i theta j let these be the eigen vector and eigen value this is the form of eigen vectors and eigen values and if there is no symmetry in the system like uh, um, so there are these static potentials right so you can choose the static potentials to break all the symmetries so then these are these these are non degenerate so then the formula for the pumped current in the long time average so that is given by this so here i refers to the particular initial state okay so it's given by this formula so this is the exact thing uh, no sorry uh, this is the exact thing this is the starting thing so we take the long time average limit so that is we this is the total time so it's in the uh, integer multiples of the time period and this is the integrated uh, current over this time so i'm dividing this so this is the long time average current so this turns out to be exactly equal to this so where so vjs are the eigen states of this floke operator and you see that it's only diagonal in the eigen states of the floke uh, uh, floke uh, eigen basis so it's only diagonal and what are this mod cij square these are the um, overlaps of these uh, vjs with the initial state psi i so i can calculate this formula exactly by doing an integral only over one time period see that's the interesting thing so i want to calculate something which is an integral over an infinite time so i have reduced it to something which is an integral only over one time period okay so so we have some results so that is so first exact result that we have is if the time if the hamiltonian is time reversal invariant then the time average current is zero this is a very uh, simple thing that one expects because if time reversal symmetry is present then the charge doesn't know means whether to go in the clockwise direction or anti clockwise direction so that is zero this can be exactly proved then another result uh, for which we don't have an exact analytical proof is the following that is one side pumping gives zero time average current for arbitrary time dependence of the hamiltonian so here this is a figure which shows these two things so this blue dotted lines this is for a time reversal invariant uh, uh, potential so here when you look at one time period so whatever current that you pump in the first half of the time period that gets cancelled by the current in the second half of the time period so on an average in one full cycle the pumped current is zero and the second red curve this red solid line this is for one side pumping so by just looking at this curve you can uh, tell that the total integral of this is zero the average of this is actually zero so there is no pairwise cancellation so there is no symmetry reason or anything but we have found this to be true numerically for a, a variety of uh, pumping potentials and uh, we have a qualitative understanding of this uh, why does this happen uh, but we don't have an exact mathematical or analytical proof of this this actually looks like a very nice uh, mathematical uh, theorem in linear algebra uh, which we have written up and you know the form of the theorem we have written up but we are not able to prove it from yeah from first principles yeah then so to pump charge in a 1d ring you need pumping at at least two sides 
and uh, yeah that's the result and this is in yeah so when there is a when there are this pumping uh, by uh, potentials on two sides it depends on the phases phi 1 and phi 2 it doesn't only depend on the difference which is the case in the continuum it depends on the relative uh, it's not only the relative it's all, it also depends on the uh, center of mass phase here uh, yeah so and pumped current um, is higher for resonant frequencies so basically we have a finite ring so there are uh, discrete energy levels so resonant means the difference between the two energy levels the difference between an occupied level and unoccupied level so when the <laughs> pumping frequency is exactly that so we see some resonance and uh, for a finite uh, ring so that this is an important difference between a one dimensional channel attached to reservoirs and a finite ring so in the finite ring we have not assumed uh, any relaxation mechanism or anything and it's a purely hamiltonian evolution so one question would be so if i have any relaxation mechanism does one side pumping give you some charge pumping so that's a that's a good question to ask so we don't know the answer to that Anyway, so the other thing is the difference between these two that is so in the infinite line there is an implicit assumption that there are these reservoirs. So they break this uh, time reversal symmetry that is so an electron which is pumped from the channel to the right reservoir let us say. So it just goes and it relaxes into that reservoir it never comes back. On the other hand in the finite ring so whatever is pumped from this uh, pumping potential on one side it eventually comes back. So that is the difference um, why we have. Uh, <coughs> one side pumping giving some uh, charge pumping in the uh, in the 1d channel which is attached to the reservoirs but in the finite ring it does not give current so this is the first part of my talk and so now i will talk about <coughs> this uh, pumping formula in the adiabatic limit so uh, to do this i will first give an outline of the scattering theory So generally you have a quantum device connected to two reservoirs. So this is a simplistic, simple, you can have more than two reservoirs, but okay. So you have some, this is a bigger picture. And you maintain these at different chemical potentials. You can also have different temperatures. Then you look at the transport properties through this quantum device. And the scattering theory is basically simple non-interacting electrons, so that, that's very simple. So that basically you write down a wave function. So this is the e to the ikx, which is an incident electron from here and then it can reflect back with uh, reflection amplitude rk so this is the e to the minus ikx which means that it's going back and then it can transmit with a transmission uh, amplitude tk and the small squares of this tk and rk so that gives the probability of reflection and transmission and this is the simple <coughs> scattering theory and i can do the other thing that is i can send in an electron from the right lead and look at the reflection and transmission amplitudes so all these amplitudes that is rk tk and amplitudes from the uh, when you send in an electron from uh, right reservoir so they all form a scattering matrix so basically the scattering matrix at a particular energy e so that relates the incoming modes uh, to the outgoing modes okay. yeah so and scattering matrix is unitary and any unitary matrix can be written in this particular form so there is a gamma, theta, alpha and phi, there are four parameters and uh, this mod squares of these have to be add up to, they have to add up to one. So mod square of this and mod square of this, so it is basically cos theta and sin theta and cos theta is like the, cos square theta is like the reflection uh, probability, okay, because, uh, because of this. And so uh, Avron et al actually showed, actually this was first, this formula actually first came up. Um, in a paper by Boutiquer, Thomas and Petre. So what does this formula say? They basically let us say you are doing some change in the, sca um, in the scattering center. Uh, that is you are doing some change in the scattering matrix let us say. So there is a scatterer which is connected to two leads and you are doing some change which is time dependent. Let us say it's adiabatic. Then the question is what does it imply on the charge which is displaced on one of the leads? So let us choose the left lead. So what is the charge which is transferred to the left lead when you do an adiabatic change in the scattering matrix? So that is given by this formula. It is cos square theta into the small change in d alpha and sin square theta into small change in d phi and minus d gamma. 
So I'll not be able to give you a full picture of this, full picture in the sense I cannot give you the meaning of all these uh, gamma, phi and all that. Uh, but uh, I'll take you to a special case that is, so let us say theta goes to 0. So that would correspond to perfect reflection, the limit of theta going to 0. So it's like an infinite barrier in between, okay. And then you have alpha also. So let's say theta is 0. So then this term disappears. So you just have minus d alpha and minus d gamma. So let's say gamma also doesn't change. So it's an overall phase in the scattering matrix. And let's say you change alpha by one complete loop. One, you do one full rotation in, the, in this 0 to 2 pi range of alpha, which is the reflection amplitude, which is the phase of the reflection uh, amplitude. So you see it is cos theta to the minus, it is i alpha here and cos theta to the minus i alpha. So this alpha is basically the phase of the reflection amplitude, if you want to think about it physically. So when, when you take this alpha through one full cycle, then you can pump a one unit of charge. This is what this formula tells you. So this is strange because you have uh, <coughs> some sort of infinite barrier. So there is no transmission at all. There is no single particle transmission. But still, by rotating the phase of the reflection amplitude, you can pump one unit of charge. This is very, this is very non-trivial. And actually, Boutiker himself, when he saw this paper, Avron et al, this PRB 2000, so this was PRB rapid communication. So after he saw this, he and Moskelets, they came up with some model to explain this. But uh, I had a chance to visit him. And I had questions about his paper. I did not understand it. He said that he also doesn't understand it well enough. And I had done this calculation in the context of topological insulators. So he told me that if you don't understand it microscopically, you should not write it. And we didn't write it finally. I have some results on this. Uh, anyway, so I'll come to my results. So I'll, <coughs> so this can be, okay. So this can be demonstrated in topological insulator systems. So that is what I'm going to. So this. The point here is to pump one unit of charge, you have to be able to change this alpha adiabatically over the 0 to 2 pi range. So in an experiment, let us say thought experiment, what is the system or what is the Hamiltonian system where this can be done? So that's the question. And we found that this can be done in uh, the context of topological insulators. So what's a topological insulator? Okay, this is just some simple background that so you have metals and insulators the difference is in a metal you have the two bands lying and you have the Fermi energy where there is a finite density of states and in an insulator you have a Fermi level and there is a gap basically there are no energy levels in this there are two bands conduction band and valence band your Fermi energy you know Fermi level lies here so that's an insulator so this is the simple non-interacting uh, band theory now what is topological insulator so you can have uh, two bands and you can still have your Fermi energy in the gap, but this is a trivial insulator, trivial band insulator, but you can have edge state spectrum. So this is, so let's say this is a 2D band structure. So I haven't drawn the other dimension. So this is a bulk band structure, but then there is an edge band structure, which actually there is like some sort of hair, which goes from the lower band to the upper band. So let us say, so this is a topological insulator. Okay, the point is it is insulating in the bulk, but on the boundary or on the edge, it is conducting. So this is a topological insulator. Uh, the simplest um, example of this is the quantum hall system. Uh, anyway, so we can discuss this later on. Uh, but let me find come to, so uh, this Bernanvig, Hughes and Zhang, they actually wrote down an exact model and they even predicted what material exhibits this. And this was in 2006 and in 2007 they actually did the experiment and confirmed that that material indeed, so this heterostructure, this is a 2D topological insulator. It's also called quantum spin hall insulator. And this is the thing, so this is a, let's say the sample of 2D topological insulator and let's say you are focusing on one edge. So here you have, uh, so the bulk is gap and you are in this bulk gap. So then on the edge this is the dispersion. There is a linear dispersion, there is a right moving mode, there is a left moving mode and the spin is also locked to it. Right moving mode is spin down and left moving mode is spin up, so that is the thing. And uh, the interesting thing about this is, so a gap does not open up by having just a time reversal invariant disorder on the edge. And this is the Hamiltonian, yeah. So I will take another 3 minutes, sorry for overshooting time. So this is the thing, so to open up a gap, 
you have to apply a magnetic field, a Zeeman field which actually mixes the spin because spin is locked to the momentum. So to be able to backscatter, you have to flip the spin. So you have to apply a magnetic field and a magnetic field, you can split it into two components. That is an easy access for the magnetic field because the spin and momentum are locked and you can split it into the component parallel to the easy axis and perpendicular to the easy axis. And this is the setup we have, okay. And this is a Hamiltonian. So we have a magnetic field only over this patch and elsewhere there is no magnetic field. So this is a spin momentum locked Hamiltonian. So this is a magnetic field. Now, yeah, the gap opens up basically. So this blue line, if you see, so that is when you have a finite Bx. So Bx basically opens up a gap. To be more precise, it is Bx comma By. So this is what opens up a gap and the gap is proportional to this, okay. And now what we can do here is, so for long enough magnetic patch, the transmission at the, in the gap, in this gap opened up by the magnetic field that is, that goes to zero. And we have the situation, so this is a scattering matrix as I told. And this alpha, so what is alpha? Alpha is basically the phase of Bx plus Ibby. So if you make this look like a complex number, so this is basically a Bx and Bby are the magnetic field. So it is the phase of this which is alpha. So now I can rotate this Zeeman field in the xy plane by one full circle adiabatically keeping its magnitude same. Now this can pump one unit of charge. So that is our result and uh, yeah so to summarize so I basically discussed charge pumping in ring like system and I showed that it is basically the charge is basically carried by the flow case states. So charge is basically pumped by the flow case states. And uh, one side pumping on a ring does not pump any charge, but uh, in a system where a channel, where the 1D channel is coupled to the two reservoirs, even one side pumping can pump charge from one side to the other. Then I discussed the adiabatic pumping formula at a time dependent scatterer. And then I discussed our work on this magnetic patch on the edge of quantum spin hall insulators. And then I showed that if the Zeeman field is rotated uh, in a particular plane adiabatically, then it can pump one unit of charge from um, one side to the other. Yes, so that's all. Thanks and any questions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So how do you define the efficiency? Because this is adiabatic pumping. So this is adiabatic pumping limit. So, so if you look at any finite time it can be done. So there is a deviation from this adiabaticity. So I think the deviation goes, so there are two parts to this. So adiabatic pumping is some sort of, uh, what I should say. Um, so there is something called area law. So you have some parameter space. So let's say, so to pump charge from one side to the other, so you need to have pumping at at least two, okay. So in the adiabatic limit, so if you want to pump charge, you have to have pumping potential at at least two sides. Or to be more general, you have to have two parameters which are changing with time. And when you do this thing, so it's some sort of berry phase. That is, so there is this area law. So when you change the two parameters in time, the area enclosed by this curve, in the parameter space. So that is proportional to the charge which is pumped. And this is in the purely adiabatic limit. But when you actually do an experiment, let us say, let's say you do a thought experiment, then the actual uh, charge which is pumped, it is not exactly that. There's a deviation from this area law. And that deviation is, I think that goes as some sort of one over omega or uh, yeah, no, it goes as omega, yeah, because Omega going to zero is the adiabatic limit where omega is the pumping frequency. Uh, yeah. So in that limit, yeah, I think this efficiency can be defined, but I I don't know much, you know, about yeah, efficiency and all that. That is that is called the dissipative limit. Yeah. Thank you.